Hi guys, let's do a lab on the integumentary system and an introduction to the skeletal system. Uh, so my first comment to you is this, most of what we're gonna talk about today, you know, at least you should, uh, provided you worked hard on your previous exam, you should have a good grasp on this material, uh, or I, at least the, the previous lecture that I put up. So this follows that lecture. Uh, there will be some things in the lab that aren't in the lecture and vice versa. But regardless, you should have a good grasp on most of this already. Now, let me just run you through the skin real quick and look at some parts and pieces. Uh, what we have, right, a good skin model like this here, is we have an upper layer, like so. This is the epidermis. Right? The epidermis is the, the strong, kind of dead skin outer layer uh, that keeps stuff from getting in. Below this is the dermis, and the dermis makes up the vast majority of the skin. Uh, this is that dense, irregular connective tissue. There's hair follicles in here. There are sebaceous glands in here. There are eccrine sweat glands in here. Uh, there's a, on a hair follicle, there are erector pili muscles. There are um, Meissner's corpuscles that deal with delicate touch sensations. Epicenean corpuscles that deal with a, a firmer touch, high pressure situation. So we've got this dermis making up the majority, and then this hypodermis. Now the hypodermis is basically the underlying fat that anchors the skin down and um, insulates, insulates. So the basic components are all here. Epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. The epidermis is primarily um, stratified squamous epithelium with this flaky keratized outer layer. We've got our hair follicles, we've got our eccrine glands, I'm sorry, we've got our sebaceous glands, we've got our eccrine glands, we've got our erector pili muscles, Cassinian and Meissner's corpuscles. All of it is here on this slide. You can expect me to pull an image like this or to use this model on your test. I will point at something and ask you to tell me what it is. Pretty simple, straightforward stuff. Uh, there are layers in the skin, all right? Layers in the skin. And you've heard me talk about this before. There's a stratum corneum. I'm going to ignore this one. Stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basale. And these are very easily seen on a real microscope slide. So this is thick skin. Thick skin is going to be from the palms or the soles of the feet. If this was thin skin, the stratocorium would only be about this big. Okay, This is thick skin, so the stratocorium is quite thick indeed. We have the stratocorium, which is the dead outer layer. We have the stratum granulosum, and the stratum granulosum is called this because it contains keratinohyaline granules that give rise to keratin and lamellated granules that give rise to lipids. So uh, the lipids are a waterproofing agent and the keratin toughens everything on the way up. So stratum granulosum. Next is the stratum spinosum, which is kind of all of this through here. The stratum spinosum is uh, the last real living cell layer. And it's important because it's in the stratum spinosum that melanin does its job. And then last but not least is the stratum basale. All right, the stratum basale as shown here. Stratum basale is the, only, the first layer of cells the first layer of pink cells as they run through there. And the stratum basale is important because it's in closest uh, contact to the underlying connective tissue. Thus, this is where all the nutrients pass into first. So these are happy, mature, um, metabolically active, and more importantly, mitotic cells. Okay, these are mitotic cells. Uh, here, so the, the skin, the stratified squamous of the skin grows from here, pushes its way up, until it becomes waterproof, then the cells die, and eventually they flake away. That is how the skin works, with melanin protecting the underlying layers from UV radiation, and the stratum spinosum, and these glycolipids and keratin molecules being produced here in the stratum um, granulosum. Yes. And you can see this quite clearly on all these images, okay? Uh, so we have our dermal papillae. This is where you find Meissner's corpuscles. That's probably one right there. Dermal papillae, those are the bumps. Then you've got your stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum corneum, that is thick skin. Over here we've got thin skin, uh, but still keratinized. You have your stratum basale, and again, look how dark the melanin is here. So this is a person with a darker complexion. You can actually see the melanin forming little hats on top of the cells in here. So get the PowerPoint out. If you don't have it out right now, get the PowerPoint out and zoom in on this. It's amazing stuff. You can see the melanin forming like a little hat on top of the cells on these lower layers of the stratum corneum. No, stratum spinosum, there we go. So stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum corneum. Uh, and I use these two slides for a purpose. 
And that is because you can see the stratum granulosum coming through here, and this is stratum granulosum through here. Uh, basali, basali. Cornium, oh geez, bear with me folks. Uh, basali, basali, um, spinosum, spinosum, granulosum, granulosum, cornium thin, cornium thick. Thick skin versus thin skin. Now, down here, it's a little bit different. This is non-keratinized stratified squamous. So this is like what you find in the inner lining of your lip, as an example. When we fill the inside of your mouth, that's this. And the main difference here is that these cells would contain a small amount of keratin, but not remotely as much as these. Ergo, instead of having this strong granulosum at the top, uh, the cells just kind of flake away. They, they don't develop this upper layering system, so they just kind of leave. Uh, I simply want you to be able to identify that this is thin skin which is what we call this. We call this uh, thin skin non-keratinized. This would be thin skin keratinized, flaky layer. This would be thick skin keratinized, flaky layer at the top. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Uh, there are layers in the dermis that are worthy for consideration. There's a papillary layer and a reticular layer. The papillary layer houses the dermal papillae, rocket science, and the reticular layer is everything else. So the uh, papillary layer is the very top line, basically just, in essence, this bit right through here, all right? And then the reticular layer is everything below it. Uh, my real comment to you would be that the dermal papillae with their Meissner corpuscles would be where you find the papillary layer, and then the reticular layer houses everything else, including the proscenium corpuscles. Good, all right, uh, this is a hair follicle so what I want you to be able to identify is one, that this is a hair follicle. Two, I want you to be able to, to identify the hair bulb, which is the enlarged base. And three, I want you to be able to identify the hair papilla, which is this portion that kind of sticks up here at the base. And I do this for a reason. Uh, this hair is no different, really, from your skin, okay? What we have here is a bunch of cells that are basically keratinocytes. They're not a whole lot different from the skin cells, uh, they grow from basically a stud of basale down here at the base. And then as they are pushed upwards, as they are constantly growing, they are pushed upwards and they get further and further away from the nutrient supply. So the cells contract on, each, on themselves and eventually what emerges from the top is a dense, hard, small diameter hair. I think I said this before in the previous lecture, but if you yank a hair out from the root, especially a thick hair, uh, you'll notice that the base of the hair is much wider, much thicker than the end of the hair. The end of the hair tends to be quite thin. And that's because the cells down here are uh, still containing cytoplasm. They're quite large, sometimes mitotically active. And then the cells at the opposing end are, are quite dead and flat and flaking away. It's no different from the skin. Okay, no different from the skin. And uh, a nail, and I'm going to keep this very simple, a nail does the exact same thing. It'll have a matrix in the back where the nail grows from and then it'll grow out, and the further out it gets, the cells will dry out, die, and harden. And that's how you get this hard nail. So uh, if you've ever seen a nail that's been pulled out of somebody, the back end of it is very floppy and loose uh, because those cells are still alive and still soft. Uh, so the skin, the hair, and the nail, they are pretty much all the same. You can take a sample from all three, grind them up, burn them through a mass spectrometer, and it's going to say it's the same substance. The only difference is the way the keratin forms up in the skin allows the cells to be kind of softer and flake away, uh, whereas in the hair and the nail, they are much harder and stick together. So very simple, very simple. All right, eccrine glands versus sebaceous, sebaceous glands. We're going to ignore apocrine glands for the time being. Uh, eccrine glands, which you'll never see one quite so pretty again, uh, form these little tubes, all these little circles. And then you can see the tube meandering through the surface of the skin there. That's a good old fashioned eccrine gland, just producing sweat basically. Uh, then there are sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands look like adipose to me. They look very fatty, very oily, if you will. And they will always be attached to hair follicles. So you can see the hair follicle, the hair bulb, the hair papilla at the base here. And then these are nice little sebaceous glands. They have this real oily appearance. Uh, so they connect to hair follicles and they'll release oils onto the surface of the skin via the hair follicle that helps to keep the skin waterproof and moisturized. And that takes us on to bone. So what I'd like to do before we do bone uh, is I'm going to show you some microscope slides of the stuff we just looked at and talk through them with you so you can actually see the slides. 
All right, <clears throat> the first one here is going to be skin thin pigmented human. I place it on my stage. I open my stage clip and I slide it in place. You'll see I don't even have a lens here. I can drop my stage, rotate in the first lens, which is four power, rotate it all the way to the top using coarse focus, and then I can peek in and do the fine focus. All right, this is our skin thin pigmented via the microscope. So what I'm gonna do is I've, I've just wound this all the way as high as high goes, and I can drop it a little bit and bring it in good focus. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Let's go settle. All right, we're a little out of focus. So I'm gonna find focus it just a little bit, get it back where it needs to be. And then we're gonna zoom it in one more time. And that's not terrible at all. All right, so what we have here, let me see if I can find a little better here. Yeah, it looks way better. All right, what we have there at the bottom, this is the stratum basale uh, that you can kind of see in there. Let me see if I've got my pointer handy. All right, let's try this again. So what we have here is the stratum basale at the bottom. So this is the underlying connective tissue made of dense irregular connective tissue. We have the strata, or I'm sorry, stratum basale at the bottom, shown here with this kind of darkish line, if you will. Right here below, or right above that, I should say, is the stratum spinosa, or stratum spinosum. There we go, that's better. And then above that, this darker line there, that is the stratum granulosum. And above that is the stratum corneum. So basale, spinosum, granulosum, corneum. Uh, and this would be thin skin. Let's see if I can play with it just a little bit here. Yeah, it might be a little better. This would be thin skin uh, and keratinized. Perfect. Now I can also pan down a little bit here. Let's zoom out as well. I can pan down and you can see this bit of eccrine gland. There's some with the pointer coming down. There's some more of the eccrine glands duct and we're going down and going down, 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 down. And here is the eccrine gland. So that right there has an eccrine sweat gland. That is what they look like under magnification. That is a good eccrine sweat gland made out of, I'm sorry, uh, stratified cuboidal epithelium. Whereas again, all of this, this is all gonna be dense irregular connective tissue. Okay, now this is another skin slide, and this one's good because it contains all these hair follicles, all right? All of these things, these are all hair follicles. Now you can see there where the pointer is, there's a little erector pili muscle, but I'm gonna show you a better area to look here. This one, this one might be a winner. All right, let's zoom in. Yeah, not bad. All right, what we have here is as follows. This is a hair follicle coming all the way down to the base there. That's all hair follicle. You can see how it gets larger. That's the hair bulb, okay? Connecting to this is an erector, oh no, no, wrong, wrong, wrong. The erector pili muscle is out here. So that's an erector pili muscle, which when that contracts would make the hair stand up and thus uh, give you your goosebumps, if you will, All right? And then between the two there, right there, that is a sebaceous gland. It's got that real adipose look to it. You see what I'm getting at here? So there, there is a sebaceous gland right there. Again, it looks a lot like adipose tissue, really looks like adipose. And if you look at the erector pili muscle, what kind of muscle is that? See how it moves? Looks like a river flowing, doesn't it? That erector pili muscle, folks, is smooth muscle. Yes, indeed. All right. All right, that's it for integument. Let's do the bone side of this. So there are two main types of bone. These are compact bone and spongy bone. 
and these can be easily seen. This is a real human skull. And if you look, you can see this kind of denser surface. That's compact bone, denser surface. It's compact bone. And then there's spongy bone inside of there. Now it's still hard. It's still quite hard. It just has a sponge-like appearance, uh, which is why we call it spongy bone. So there is compact bone and there is spongy bone. Now, when we look at bone tissue itself, uh, there are some features that we really need to talk about. These are osteocytes in their lacunae, the lamellae, which are rings, osteocytes in the cells, lacunae are the houses they live in, the lamellae are the rings, uh, there are central canals, which are also referred to as being Haversian canals. There are perforating canals, which are also referred to as being Volkmann's canals. Canaliculi, which are projections off the osteocytes. There are Sharpies fibers on the outer surface. And uh, then the whole structural units called osteons, called osteons. And it looks something like this. We have an osteon with a central canal made up of individual rings called lamellae. Inside of there, there are all these little black spots. So here's our central canal. But all these little black spots, all this, all these little black spots, those are all osteocytes in an opening called a lacunae or a lacuna. Okay? So we've got our osteon, we've got our lamellae, we've got our uh, osteocytes. There's a perforating or Volkmann's canal pretty happy. Uh, you can see the little the, the little hairline cracks. It's kind of hard to pick up here. I'll have to show you on the scope. Uh, but there are little hairline cracks that look like between all of these osteocytes. Those are the canaliculi. Yeah, and then that brings us to this bone model. Now you're going to see this model again. Okay, you're going to see this again. I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be on your test. So prepare yourselves. Uh, what we have on this bone model are the osteons. All right, these are osteons. Brown units are osteons. Uh, central canals going through the middle of these. There are perforating canals going right to left, connecting the central canals together. Uh, there are cells here that are osteocytes. And those osteocytes are living inside of the openings called lacunae. And then the little cracks, okay, the hairline cracks, the little projections off of these osteocytes, off the lacunae, those are canaliculi. Uh, that basically allow two osteocytes to come into contact with one another so that they can communicate and exchange materials. Uh, on the outer surface of the bone, you can't really see it here in this particular image, but the outer surface of the bone, you would find periosteum, and that periosteum is a thick fibrous connective tissue, and it is anchored to the bone itself using Sharpie fibers. So all of this is fair game. Uh, here is a good old general long bone, and on that long bone, I'd like for you to know the following. There is a diaphysis, a proximal epiphysis, and a distal epiphysis. You need to know which one's which. Proximal epiphysis, close to the trunk of the body. Distal epiphysis, further away from the trunk of the body. There would be a marrow cavity in there, and it would be full of yellow bone marrow in this adult. All right? uh, there are a variety of shapes to bones. There are long bones like these and these, which are longer than they are wide. There are short bones like the carpals here that are basically little shells of compact bone with spongy bone inside of them. Uh, there are flat bones like that in the skull there. And then there are irregular bones that don't fit any normal classification scheme like your vertebrae or shown here. This is your sinoid bone from the skull. And uh, that is it for this lab. And I'm going to go ahead and shoot the bone lab as well. But first, I want to show you a bone slide and go into a little more detail on it. All right, what we have here is osseous tissue. And this is at low power magnification. I'm going to zoom in a few times here. And we're going to see if we can't make out some details. Yeah. That's not terrible. What you see here is an osteon. Now again, there are osteons just all over the place in this bone tissue. They're just everywhere. And I don't know what's going on with the light here, folks. I wish I understood it better. 
as I zoom in on an osteon, what you can see is the central canal here. Here's the osteon made up of individual lamellae. You can see some osteocytes here and there. And those osteocytes would have radiating canaliculi, which you may or may not be able to make out in this image. Uh, but yeah, that's bone tissue right there, folks. For some strange reason. Oh, there it goes. Look at that. There's always a way, folks. Now let's see if I can get it even better. Uh, we can see osteons all over the place. All these, these round concentric units, these are all osteons. Like you can really tell here that this is a single osteon made of many rings. The rings are lamellae. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Let's see if we can find a really pretty osteocyte with clear um, canaliculi. I think they're all going to be a little too small for the level of magnification that this microscope is capable of. But I'm looking. Oh well. It's not terrible. So you got to keep in mind that all of these dark spots, all of this, these are all going to be osteocytes hanging out in their lacunae. Yeah, this is going to have to be good enough.